So welcome along to our Google Plus Hangout this afternoon or in other parts of the world different times but we are here to discuss the topic of should our houses or if you're someone who's building at the moment should you create a house which is off-grid. Um, we've got a really good panel yet again. I'm really thankful for that. So I think that's how we'll start this Hangout, is to get everyone to introduce themselves. So Ken, would you like to start? Yes, my name is Ken Silverstein, and I'm a writer for Forbes and the Christian Science Monitor, um, and I cover the energy sector. And what about you, Mike? Uh, my name is Mike Coe and I'm a self-builder here in the UK. Um, I built the Cropthorne Autonomous House which has become quite well known I think. Um, it's probably one of the most energy efficient uh, private houses in Britain um, and it is off-grid for water and sewage um, but is actually connected to the grid for electricity but with the capability to go off-grid relatively easily should I decide to do so. And I will explain as well that Mike has had some issues, haven't you, with your webcam. So if you're watching the feed of this right now and wondering, oh, but why are we looking at a picture of Mike? He does exist in reality. He's just there as a picture. For today. My, my webcam experience has been an unmitigated <laughs> catastrophe, to be honest. <laughs> and Mike is a character too, as we'll get to know. And then we've got Paul. Hello, Paul. Hi, all. I'm Paul Sheckel, and... Um... I've been an energy efficiency and renewable energy consultant for the last 25 years or so, and for almost that same period of time, I've lived off-grid here in the northeastern U.S., and off-grid limited to electricity, although I do have some stories about trying to get off of uh, the propane grid as well, and uh, I've written a couple of books about the subject, and i um, looking forward to the conversation today. Well, should we stay with you? Maybe because, as you mentioned, you've written a, a couple of books. What does it mean when we're talking about going off-grid? Well, typically going off-grid is a term used when we try to disconnect from the electrical power lines. And that's kind of how it's seen in, in, in a you know, broad and also very limited sense. Um, so off-grid, you know, the, the power grid. I like to take the approach where we can get off of multiple grids. We can try to get off the transportation grid, get off the propane grid, get off the fossil fuel grid, so to speak, um, and, and take it as, as wide and deeply as we can. And just continuing this a bit, uh, who were the first people to go off grid? Uh, perhaps Ken, you can explain a little bit. You've been writing about all these issues that affect energy over the years. Uh, has has it changed, or is it the same amount of people who are off grid? No, it's the it's a trend that's escalating, but it's it's not one that's without controversy. Um, in fact, there's a lot of controversy attached to it. Um, it may, on the surface, seem like a rather benign concept. But, um, so to answer your question, the reason this trend is escalating, at least here in the United States, is that um, the cost of rooftop solar panels is, has dramatically fallen, and, it, and the price keeps falling, which makes them an inexpensive proposition for homeowners. At the same time, the people selling them are providing attractive financing options so it's becoming um, uh, an, an economical option for homeowners to do with the financing, the low cost of the panels, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's the government incentives, which are also uh, increasing um, uh, the trend, if you will. Um, the reason it's controversial is that the more people who come off the grid uh, means fewer people are there to support the existing grid, which makes electricity expensive for those who can who cannot afford to go off the grid. So is it the, the best system to be using at this time? When it was set up, we understand that you'd have your power station or whatever it might be, but as we've moved on in technology, is it still the best way of delivering energy and as customers, is it still the best choice for us? You mean to go off the grid or the grid itself? 
Well, let's stick with the grid to begin with, because that, it was obviously created as a good idea of this is what we should be doing. This is a good way for us collectively to all have power. Well, a, a centralized grid has a lot of advantages, which is why it it, it came to be. And the, the advantage is, is that it can more efficiently distribute electrons to a mass number than if electricity is dis uh, distributed on site. Okay, so it's a more efficient system, um, but there's a lot of drawbacks to a centrally planned system. Um, it's very difficult to get transmission sighted. Um, their transmission lines are ugly, so there's um, some incentive to, to, for it to be distributed. If there's a hurricane, there's less of a chance um, mass numbers would be wiped off uh, off the grid. Um, we saw what happened in, in New York and New Jersey during uh, Tropical Storm Sandy. So there's some advantages to being distributed, but uh, for the vast majority of us, for the foreseeable future, and Mike and Paul may disagree, but I would argue that the vast majority of us are going to remain attached to the grid, and that there needs to be some equitable system uh, to pay for that. Uh, because the grid still needs to be modernized and even expanded in many cases. Well, that's a really good point. So let's move on. Mike, why did you go off grid? Um, I, actually, I was about to bounce in and say I'd, I'd like to not disagree with, with that, uh, with, <laughs> with Ken. Um, I, as I said, I'm not completely off grid. I, I use the electricity grid as a battery. Um, and I did that because that seemed to be the most sensible way to proceed at the time. So I have a photovoltaic array, um, which at the moment, for instance, I'm just looking, we're exporting about 500 watts, so I'm generating more power than I'm using. But when we come to, obviously, night time, um, even though the house has been constructed to have minimal energy consumption throughout, we will still be drawing in power. Um, at, at the moment, for me to go off-grid, it would be more of an ideological decision than one that made any kind of financial or engineering sense because the, the amount of batteries that you would require and the extra electronics and so forth um, would be costly um, and not necessarily environmentally benign when you're talking about lots of lithium or nickel, nickel metal hydride or whatever storage cells. I th and I think there are, there are different reasons that people go off grid. Uh, some people do do it for ideological reasons. Other people are beginning to do it um, as, as Ken was saying, for, for financial reasons, because the photovoltaic panels have become so cheap. Um, and other people, of course, do it out of necessity because they actually aren't in a position to be able to connect to a grid at all because they live somewhere very, very remote. So I think people have different reasons for doing it. But mine was it fitted in with the whole overall low energy design strategy to stay on grid, but in a way to use it as a battery. And you're also, you've mentioned that it's not just the grid, but you have other aspects of your house so that you are totally independent. Do you foresee these um, situations arising, or as you say, is it it's just all about energy efficiency, really? It was in my case. Uh, I'm just going to briefly say um, I was reading the other day that apparently the um, those um, dark and despotic dark and despotic um, oil magnates, the Koch brothers, um, I think in conjunction with the American um, Republican Party, are attempting to put a tax, aren't they, on people who actually have photovoltaic installations? Um, obviously, they have massive interest in the oil industry, and they can see their possible um, there's a loss of funding coming because people are generating more and more of their own power. So they're trying to put a tax on people who've got photovoltaic installations on the basis that it's destabilizing the electricity grid and therefore they should be made to pay for that. I don't know, that's that's just a side issue. Um, but coming back to your question, Ben, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't connect to mains water or mains drainage, even though we have them available. So I haven't, I haven't disconnected from those out of necessity. In this case, it really is for environmental reasons because I, it seemed to me in designing a house that, that intrinsically is ultra low energy, it, it, you've still got other energy demands made by private dwellings and the, the, provi the provision of a water supply and the taking away of your waste and processing it and so forth actually involves quite a lot of energy which you don't really have any control over. You can't say, well, I, I'm going to go to the toilet a lot less so that I don't um, put such a load on the sewage system. So by, by bringing those services in-house, by, by storing rainwater, treating it, 
um, to provide the house's water supply and then by using a dry composting toilet system to deal with all of our own personal waste um, together with a grey water soak away. I've brought those services in-house but I've done it in such a way that they don't expend any additional energy at all. So that was very much done for an environmental reason. And maybe, uh, Paul, it's worth coming to you and just finding out what we've heard a little bit about Mike. How do you um, compare to, to what he is and, and where is your geographic location? Are you near to civilization, near to a city or on, you know, out in nowhere? Yeah, we're pretty far from civilization here, which is primarily why we ended up off-grid. Um, it would have cost us about $50,000 to bring power lines in. We live in an old, uh, on an old piece of farmland, and it's, it's quite rural. Um, uh, however, I, I think I, I didn't exactly fall into this position. I mean, yes, it was the, the piece of land that I could afford 25 years ago when, when I, I was looking for land. But also, there's a bit of altruism there, too. I have always been interested in solar power. I've always been interested in energy efficiency and electric cars and all of those things I've done in my life um, to <laughs> try to earn a living, which was not a very good way to go in the 90s trying to make electric cars. Um, and, uh, but also for the, the altruism and you know, the, sort of the green living and the self-sufficiency of it, I've always tried to be as self-sufficient as I can, which yeah, as, as I get older, I realize what a myth that really is. But um, in terms of you know, getting off of various grids, as I discussed earlier, I've made biodiesel for, for several years to try to meet my transportation needs. Um, a few years ago, after we upgraded our solar electric system, I uh, was hit with a, um, a very large propane bill. And you know, after feeling so smug about having excess electricity and um, you know, a lot of uh, hot water to heat as a dump load, I, I was hit with this large bill. So I thought, well, how can I get off of the, the propane grid? So I started to investigate ways to make renewable natural gas. And there's a chapter in one of my books about um, making backyard biogas. So part of it is altruism, part of it was financial reason, and part of it was because for me it's a whole lot of fun. I, I love technology and I love harvesting uh, energy from nature, and this is one way for me to, to help fulfill that, that need for that sort of project. And is the book as well, or the couple of books that you've written, just sharing that knowledge that you have learned over the years? Sure. It's sharing that knowledge. Uh, the first book I wrote as sort of a reference guide for myself, but also for other energy auditors and uh, interested homeowners. And the second one was um, sharing that knowledge and also the enthusiasm for things like making wood gas. You, know, you can actually run a car on wood gas. And you can heat your hot water with, with uh, renewable natural gas that you make from food scraps from your, uh, from your kitchen. So there's a lot of interesting things that I think we can do and perhaps will need to do in the future as, um, as we live in a more and more carbon-constrained world. One thing that keeps popping into my mind is that the majority of us live in cities or, or mass population of the world. So does that not necessarily mean that um, we are, are going to have just these few people who go off grid will be in rural locations? I can't see it being anywhere else because it wouldn't make sense to do this in a city or would it? Does anyone want to pick up on that? I personally don't recommend anybody go off grid if you're already on the grid. I, I, I just I think it's not a great idea. I love using the, the grid as, as battery storage. And I say that primarily because it's so energy intensive to as, as was mentioned earlier, to um, you know, get all of those pieces of equipment. I've got 50 kilowatt hours of battery storage. I've got 24, um, batteries. It's about a ton and a half of lead in a shed outside that wow. I have to replace every 10 years. It's, it's kind of crazy. So um, hey ben, be careful in your choices. Ben? Yes. Um, can I ask Paul a question? I Go for it. Yes, this is a discussion. You know, it doesn't need to be led by me necessarily. So anyone well, jump in when you want to. I, I think uh, Mike has answered it in his previous comment. But Paul, I would say um, what you said actually, there's a lot of questions implicit 
in what you said, but one of them is that when the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing, how, how are you getting your electricity? How, how are the lights remaining on? And is that storage system that you're using, um, for lack of a better term, efficient? Is it efficient? Well, um, it's, it's lead acid battery technology. Okay. It's over 100 years old. Um, they're about 70% efficient in terms of um, storing and releasing the, the energy that's put into it. So I have a battery backup system so when the sun shines, the batteries are being charged. When the wind blows, I have a, a thousand watts of wind uh, production capacity. Um, the batteries are being charged. And when the sun goes down and the wind stops blowing, I draw down the batteries. In the wintertime, that can be problematic. I have a backup generator because there are months where the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. And I need an additional source of electricity. And that, I mean, that one might... thing, sorry, I was just jumping in, if I may, Ben. Go for it. It's Mike, yes. Um, I mean, obviously, the, 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 there are considerable amounts of um, effort and cash being put into um, developing advanced battery systems, aren't they, driven by, well, we, obviously, we, the lithium battery came about largely because of the, uh, the, the portable computers and mobile telephones and things. And obviously, now, the development of electric vehicles um, and this um, famous uh, Tesla factory that te Tesla Motors intend to de devote huge um, uh, amounts of, of effort and, and finances into a specialist battery factory and there are other potential technologies possibly still in the, the laboratory at the moment. I heard of a lead water battery. I mean I don't know if that ever has the, the, the possibility of, of becoming a, a, a true practical product but in terms of being off-grid I think it's likely um, that Paul's lead acid batteries will soon be superseded by something that is much, much more efficient, um, stores a lot more energy in the, in the smaller space, and ultimately, price per kilowatt hour of storage is almost inevitably going to come down. And oh, I suppose I so. that that is a large part of this. It, it does sound like batteries have held us back, but are we at the point when actually more of this, and, and we've been saying that it's picking up momentum, but it will make sense. Ken, do you want to take us? I, you, you know, on the economics of it, um, that that's not an easy question to answer. Um, I, I agree with Mike's sentiments that battery technology will get better and it will get cheaper, um, but there is a, a transition period that is yet to be defined in terms of how long that will take. We're clearly not there yet. Um, there are... In, in the United States, California has a mandate for the utilities to buy battery storage uh, to increase its economies of scale. That'll help things along. Uh, um, a government mandate to give the uh, developers some incentive uh, to go into the labs and create because they have uh, a ready-made market. Um, but at this point, I think battery storage is not where it needs to be, and and until it gets to that point, um, the economics of it for most of us just doesn't add up. And Paul, are there any other things that we should be thinking about going about uh, back to the question that I said at the beginning of um, should my next house be off grid? What do we need to consider? You've produced this book which is has got lots of information in. So where would we start? <laughs> Well, start with efficiency. That's always my, my mantra. Efficiency is first, renewables next. If you have a very efficient house, you have a house that doesn't require lots of energy input. And that is a way of basically lowering the cost of your energy supply, right? By, by reducing the amount you need to buy. It also allows you to diversify your energy uh, sources. So you can, if you need the grid, you're not going to need very much of it. If you need solar, you're not going to need very much of it. So start with efficiency. Um, you know, who, who would rather burn a thousand gallons of oil um, instead of uh, burning a hundred gallons of oil? Or the same with wood. We heat primarily with wood. I would rather cut, split, stack, and burn, you know, one cord rather than three cords of wood. So start with efficiency and then identify what resources you have 
what's available, what's practical, what's cost effective. Really, it comes down to what are your what are your values, what are your goals, um, what 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 do you want to do with your home? What statement do you want to make? Um, what's comfort level are you willing to uh, negotiate with yourself and your family? And Mike, with your house, you've I have been lucky enough to visit it, and it's lovely and warm even in, in the depths of winter so has this cost you a lot of money I know that one of the questions that I saw before we started this hangout that was just um, sitting there was that I'd like to go off grid but the cost is too much um, well but there are, it depends on how you approach it obviously I mean I, I would absolutely agree with what Paul just said is that you put energy efficiency first um, get the building envelope right um, high thermal mass in my case huge amounts of insulation and, and then whatever the future holds for us in terms of um, fuel shortages or changes in technology or changes in um, climate which is obviously uh, an important consideration if you've got your building envelope right then you can change the ancillaries that, that support it relatively easily um, in my case yes I I didn't really set it because I'm not a property developer because it was very much a self-build I didn't set out to build necessarily a house that could be scaled up into multiple units I set out to effectively to make the best job I possibly could and and people can take what they want from it. I mean, there are, there are many, many examples of the way this house has been built that can be translated to, to other buildings. But it was always a question of, yes, get the house as energy efficient as possible. Um, and I did pay a premium for that to a certain extent. I, I could have built a, um, the same size house more cheaply, or I could have built a bigger house on the same site if the local council would have allowed me to um, you know, for the same cash. But my, the, the overriding um, factor in the decision-making process was always, well, is this, is this efficient? Is this going to give us the best possible energy performance? But now that the house is operational and it's pretty much finished, apart from those little irritating jobs that you never get around to completing, <laughs> uh, and it's performing, um, it has exceeded my expectations fairly considerably. Um, and without going into immense detail, compared to the relatively ordinary um, Victorian semi-detached house that we were living in previously, typical of, of the type of houses that many people in Britain still live in um, with standard servicing, I am saving uh, more than £3,000 a year, so m more than approaching $5,000 a year, I am better off by that amount uh, simply by living in this house. And you're more comfortable, as, as you've mentioned. We're yeah. getting towards the end of our hangout. And um, I suppose we need to uh, just come up with some closing thoughts. But, Ken, I wanted to just ask you about um, more of this um, maintaining the u utilities. How do you think they view this movement if it is gaining traction? Um, well, this is what the, the original comments that I made that I didn't yet expound upon. The u utilities, um, for obvious reasons, feel threatened by this phenomenon. Um, and, and the reason is is because they collectively spend twenty five billion dollars a year in this country uh, to maintain the grid and to improve it um, and then ultimately to expand it. So if more people go off the grid that leaves fewer people to support the grid which means that utilities would have a harder time raising the capital they need to um, to make the improvements they would need. They'd have they'd go to the capital markets and potentially pay higher to borrow money to make these improvements. Investors would demand uh, um, a risk premium, if you will. Um, so utilities are are resistant to this change. Uh, I mean, naturally, if they're selling less electricity, they're also making less money. And so there needs to be some type of reconciliation between the utilities uh, that maintain the grid and those who go off the grid. And that's a lot of these battles that are going on statewide. And as you and I were discussing previous uh, uh, to this um, uh, seminar, um, you know, it's a little like the public school system. Uh, which is, at least where we live, it's supported by property taxes, whether you have a child in school or not, with the idea that public schools are a benefit to everyone, so everyone pays property taxes, regardless of whether or not they have children in private schools or whether or not they have children in schools, because the idea 
is that it's a public good, and the, and the grid similar, similarly is a public good. Um, when you feed electricity to people's homes or to businesses, it creates an economic ripple effect that keeps going. So having a durable and reliable grid is, um, is a vital, vital thing. Um, so I'm very sympathetic to the utilities arguments that there needs to be some type of equitable cost sharing arrangement. I wanted to also add a very quick thing about the battery storage and how long a timeline that is if I can, and I'll be brief. Um, in the story, which I think is where you came upon me that was just in Forbes, um, I had interviewed the Rocky Mountain Institute and it suggests that in the sunnier climates like Hawaii and in the southwest that this trend toward uh, more self-reliance will be um, uh, much faster than it will be in say the east coast where it's primarily uh, cheaper coal burning uh, power uh, but it, it seems to think that the trend will happen nationally at some point but it'll it'll begin on the west and then gradually, you know, move into the areas that are more reliant on cheaper burning fossil fuels. Paul, do you have any closing thoughts for us? I'd just like to follow up on uh, what Ken just said. And here in Vermont, one of the, the smallest states in, in the country, um, we have a net metering law, and that allows for um, renewable energy grid tie-ins to um, max out at about 4% of grid capacity. And we're meeting that, and some of the utilities here have exceeded that 4%, and they're getting nervous. And that 4% of revenue loss means to them that they're spending a larger portion of their budget on uh, poles and wires maintenance, and they're, they're, losing, they're losing money, and they are nervous about that. On the same hand, on the other hand, um, uh, homeowners, you know, residents, commercial, um, everybody wants solar. Everybody wants the advantage of low costs and, and great incentives that are out there now. So uh, now we have a new bill working through the legislature, but it's it's getting to be an interesting um, set of, of uh, dilemmas out there that we need to face, and it'll be an interesting future as as the grid changes and our, our sense of energy and carbon changes over time. And Mike? That, that, yeah, that, just picking up on that point, it's, it's an interesting thing, it's a strange situation perhaps that the traditional utilities find themselves in, 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 in that their core business is kind of being eroded in a way that they can't really control. And we've had, um, I, I can't remember what the current state of it is, but we've had in the UK um, various incentives whereby um, electricity and gas companies have been obliged by government to help people improve the ins insulation of their houses so that they can reduce their energy demands and so, on and so forth. It's been part of the whole package. But that puts any commercial entity in a very strange position where they are actually having to subsidize methods that will will ultimately reduce their, their revenue, reduce their income. It's a bit like I set up a furniture factory but I'm, I, I'm obliged by legislation to, to provide grants to people so that they don't need to use as much furniture. So it's a very odd situation. Um, there's one further thing um, which possibly applies more to the UK than anywhere else, but it, it, it relates to peak gas and peak oil and, and peak traditional fuels. Um, in the, I mean, we've had a, a sort of disastrous um, series of, of decisions about um, re-equipping the UK's gen energy generating capacity. We've, we've just about managed to persuade the Chinese to build a new nuclear power station here, which won't come on stream until probably 2030 or something. We're paying a massive price for it. Um, we, we are apparently um, beginning to look at bringing in massive um, diesel generators for emergency backup because it is perceived that there's not going to be enough spare capacity in the grid to meet peak demands in coming years. Um, if we have you know, exceptional drain on the system due to unusual weather patterns, we, we have a real risk in this country anyway of um, the, the grid collapsing at various times, which is why the government are sneaking in these enormous diesel generators, uh, which obviously isn't environmentally great, but they're desperate that the lights don't go out. I think having, uh, in that context, the capability to go off grid and, and distance yourself from all of that, should the power supplies become unreliable, it's certainly a very worthwhile facility to have at your disposal. I hope it's not required, but I mean, not wishing to sound smug and pompous, um, I'm in a better position to cope with it than somebody who's living in a traditional grid-connected house with no backup. 
Well, it's been brilliant to chat to you all. Uh, does anyone want to um, promote their website? Or, uh, Paul, do you want to push the book again? Yes, sure. Um, the Homeowner's Energy Handbook is um, my latest adventure in helping you get more efficient and uh, use renewable energy in inter interesting ways. And Ken? I, I don't need to promote anything. You're OK. Mike, what about you on um, Twitter? Well, I'm not. I'm not promoting for um, for for, my, for financial gain, but just for the. the uh, if people are interested, um, they're very welcome to. I, I, in fact, I think if you search for autonomous house on Google, I think I'm the number one result now. But the Cropthorne Autonomous right. House or CropthorneHouse.co.uk. Anybody thinking of entering into a low energy building project project is likely to find um, the, the site interesting. Obviously, it's it's my own experience, so it gives you it's part of the experience of being a self builder as well as a lot of detail of, of building. What is genuinely, I think, an ultra low energy uh, private house. And that brings us to a close, so thank you very much for watching.